Hey everybody, this is Scott Homan with Witness Underground, the documentary and podcast. Today we have a very special guest. This is Elle with El Reno Coaching. She just did something amazing for our project. We're, we have a live uh, Kickstarter campaign right now to raise money to release Witness Underground in a general public release on common streaming platforms. So if you haven't seen that yet, go check it out. And the exciting thing is El, El Reno, who is joining us here today, signed up to be a pledged to be a associate producer on the film. We up until now, we have only had one associate producer and with this campaign, where is an option to gain more. And as a part of that, your name goes in the credits, you go on IMDb and then you're part of the family forever. And it's permanently in the system, in the movie history. Um, so welcome Al. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Tell us a little bit about you and your coaching. And, and also why, why this was uh, interesting to you and you got involved. Um, I've been part of the XJW community since about 2018 when I was starting to wake up. I completely left in 2020. And uh, in June, I certified to become a, a life coach. And for a while, I was um, trying to figure out what was my, my niche and I really didn't want anything to do with um, anything that has anything to do with JW. I just wanted to sort of close the door on that and, <clears throat> and move on. But the more that I got involved in the community, the more I realized like how much I could really help people and make an impact. And it was just like a light switch went on one day and I was like, mm. that's what I meant to do. That's amazing. So, so it's a new thing, the coaching, the licensing for coaching. Is that right? Yeah. June I was this year? June, yeah. And I've coached uh, quite a few clients already, but um, XJW clients, this is, is new, but I know that I have the, the background being born in and, and all the coaching I've done on myself to get me where I am now. So I'd love to dive into that. What, what was it that drew you to coaching originally? You know, it started a long time ago. Honestly, it started back when I was a teenager and I was reading Deepak Chopra. Mm. <laughs> and it was like, I always had that like spiritual side to me and also just kind of curious and questioning, you know, and a lot of times I didn't. I didn't believe it fully, but, you know, the JW way, but I went along with it because I didn't know anything different. Mm -hmm. And I've listened to life coaches over the years. And then it, a light bulb went off when I found the life coaching school. And that's where I got certified. Mm -hmm. um, it was just like instantly, like that week I signed up and I dove into it head first. And it was everything that I've always believed but then it was put into like this little um, tangible package of this is life coaching. It was just, you know, it's changed my life 100%. Yeah. What, what would you say the, this is what I believe to quote you a minute, 10 seconds ago. Uh, what were those <laughs> things and what are they now? What's changed? Yeah. So what it is, is we have circumstances that come up in our life. It's just life. It's just actual facts. And then we have thoughts about those facts. Those thoughts that we have create a feeling in us. The feelings that we have make us do certain things. We take action in our lives, you know, whether that's good or bad. And from those actions, we create our results in our life. And so it's just very clear. And once we can change our thinking about certain things, then it's going to change everything. It's going to change our feeling. It's going to change what we do. And it's going to change our whole life because the result is an absolute 100% transformation. Have you had that in your life? Yes. Yeah. So the What's a good example of how that works for someone who doesn't know anything about coaching or, or this concept of like separation of sensation, emotions, thinking, and like, can you like give an example for a new person? Yeah, I will. Um, and I'll go back to the, you know, the reason that I, um, that I 
that I finally woke up is when I watched the Australian Royal Commission and I watched it as an actual court case and I mm. read, you know, all of these things. And, and that took me back to my childhood of um, being abused. Mm. And for the longest time, I felt like um, my weight was sort of protecting me in some way. Like that was my protection. If I ever got back to the weight that I was when I was abused, that somehow, you know, I, I didn't allow myself to do it because something in me thought that I would be hurt again. And so when I finally disconnected the two, my weight is one thing, you know, a pedophile is another thing. And I told, it's like, that's just one example of a wall that was broken down. Wow. I'd never thought of those things being connected. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting, like a, per a perception of your, of your body and the, yeah, the damage that happened from someone else. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Um, as far as, um, the transition. So you had this idea of like closing the chapter on the whole Jehovah witness, um, religious background and moving forward with a new life. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really healthy. And I want people to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do shut that door, but they also are like compartmentalizing that in their minds and never really dealing with it or working through it. Like it happens a lot. I see this I, in the dialogue of the, the former member community online. I see a lot of dialogue about how something's still triggering decades later. And that's also totally fine that that happens and not an indication that's unhealthy because we can all have triggers, but like some people are still wrapped up in or still believe the things that they were told are still in the program loops that the religion, you know, put into mm -hmm. us. It's interesting that you, you had this desire to close a chapter and do something new. And then you got there, you got some new education and you're like, well, actually like I could reach back and like bring people out yeah. or help them out or help them shorten the, maybe you can talk instead of me <laughs> wondering, <laughs> but yeah. How, how was, how was that transition for you? Um, I like to think of it like, all the JW stuff, basically what I did, it was just a junky um, room. Let's say it's like a room in the house and it was just filled with all these boxes of all these beliefs and things that, you know, I thought were true. Right. And it just, and I just closed the door. So it happened mm -hmm. when I started coaching and coaching myself and hiring my own coach. As I opened the door, I turned on the light and I didn't just go through it all in one day. I went through it box by box and I took out mm -hmm. each box and looked into it and like, and looked and see what is it that I believe? Not what I was taught. Mm -hmm. What, what do I really believe about things? And that's what coaching is. It's really just loving people for who they are, which we never got the chance to, to do or to be. We never got to be loved for who we truly are. And so it's just looking at how we are as individuals and, and that's okay, you know, and it's helping us get to our highest self or our best version of ourself. And so that's what that process kind of looked like to me. It's interesting that analogy of opening up the boxes, like the, in storage. Um, yeah. I did, I started therapy a couple of years ago and mm -hmm. that was an analogy that the the therapist, she was a ex Mormon and did like internal family systems, uh, EDMR uh, as tools and internal family systems, like all the different versions of yourself inside that are like mm -hmm. this age or that age or this perspective. Mm -hmm. or, and then I'm just learning about that still, but her, her, one of her specialties that I found on the secular therapy project was mm -hmm. that she had a, no religious affiliation and she specialized mm -hmm. in um, leaving a faith community is one mm -hmm. of her specialties and she was amazing. Uh, and she, she used this analogy of shutting the closet and it's like a cartoon closet where you open the door and as you're like a kid and like all the stuff falls out, cause it's like so jam packed <laughs> full of stuff. It's completely disorganized and cluttered. Okay. And she's like, you need to go through every single thing in that closet or every box of stuff okay. in there. Yeah. And some of it's worthwhile and some of it's not, but you can't, you can't get rid of any of it. Like uh -huh. you can, you can decide what to do with some of this stuff. Like, like, okay. She didn't say can't get rid of any of it, but it's like, it's all a part of you uh -huh. and it, you need to work through it. 
like organize mm-hmm. it in a way that's logical, not just shut the door on the closet with all the things. Like mm-hmm. you open the, her analogy was like, you open the closet door and you take one box and like that is a box filled with good stuff, but there's like a couple bad things or things in there that are like really emotional. And mm-hmm. you like, you shut the box and you like slam it back in the closet is one way to deal with it. But if you okay. want to like get through it is like actually go through everything in the closet, take out the good stuff that you want to keep. I can recognize it for what it is and like take the stuff you you definitely don't want to be in your, having your life anymore and like take it to the thrift shop and like put it, sell it to someone else. <laughs> no, just like get rid of it. Um, as like a, you know, the, to run the analogy to its end, um, uh-huh. organize your closet. <laughs> and I think it's like a similar idea to what you're talking about. Yeah. I like to think of my boxes. Some of them I didn't want to keep, you know, it's like, man, I, I don't actually believe that that's not true, mm-hmm. but some of the boxes I kept and, some of them do serve me, you know, some of, some of the things that we were raised, um, you know, just different values that we were given, you know, some of them, they are kind of okay. You know, like Mm -hmm. I do kind of want to hold on to just a couple little things, you know? So what if, what if somebody wanted to work with you? What would that look like? Like, how do you start that process? Yeah. So they would just reach out to me. Um, I'm on Facebook. I get a lot of messages on Facebook through messenger. Um, what I do is I, I do total transformations. So it's a year long working with me because that really is what it takes to go through everything. So, and, and another big thing I want to say too, is that the thing is, is a lot of times when we have feelings that come up, when we open that box, we have a feeling and we don't, instead of like really just feeling it and just being in it and surviving the feeling, a lot of times people will just close the box or maybe they're going to buffer with alcohol or drugs or relationships or shopping or, you know, there's, or eating, there's all these things that we do to like not feel, but Mm -hmm. really what I'm doing is I am with that client 100% so they can go through and feel everything all, you know, one thing at a time and know mm-hmm. that you're not going to die from it. It's, it's just a feeling and it passes. And once yeah. you process it like that, you, you're really able to create anything you want in your life because you're not afraid of feeling anything, whether it's a good feeling or bad feeling. Yeah. There's something, um, a woman I just met, um, who also has this background, she had a family experience recently where she shared something personal. I won't say who it is or get too detailed, but um, basically she realized like during a really, what would be a normally a really emotional situation, uh-huh. um, completely dissociated. I was just like, uh-huh. yeah, well, you know, people die, whatever things mm-hmm. happen. All right, what else? You know, just like completely cool and neutral about mm-hmm. something that would be completely tragic moment in anyone's life losing someone you love. Mm-hmm. And that was like a realization, um, which I think is fascinating. And I wonder to what degree we sort of do that. And it came up in uh, a podcast episode a couple of days ago with Stephen Mather called hackers mm-hmm. where someone talked about like, we are just, he talked about with one of the guests, it was like a cascade of guests in a row that like we're observers when we're in that faith group. Like we mm-hmm. see the world for what it is. We watch the yeah. news. We talk about the news. We're not a part of anything. We're just like watching it or even I made me think of like the word witness. It's like, yeah, we're just watching the television, but we're not a part of the the thing at all kind of thing. Um, And I wonder like how much of living that way for decades or being trained to not be a part of something or be separate Mm -hmm. makes you dissociate from reality. Mm-hmm. Have you have any thoughts on that? Cause they're kind of just new ideas that are just like coming up in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would just be another way of what I would call buffering. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, if you just completely shut it out, you don't have to feel anything right. Like good mm-hmm. or bad. Like, um, yeah, you just completely shut the door. Yeah. That's one yeah. way of buffering. But what I encourage people to do is, um, for them to be open and be able to get to the place where they can feel that. And they're not afraid of it. It's really yeah. valuable. Mm-hmm. It feels like a really human, human approach or in like well, holding someone's hand through the process. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we all have, you know, even though we're all G- XGWs, you know, that we all have such different experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of experience, you know, a lot of different things have happened to me over the years. And at my ripe age of 48, you know, a lot of life has happened. But I just see it. Um, I just see it so much differently now, you know, because for, for years I had gone back and forth, you know, in and out and like, I really want to make my mom happy and, and do this because, you know, it's like, you know, it's the only way that I'm ever going to be happy. But it was like, it never resonated with me. And when I completely um, woke up and broke free of it, it's like the light came on. And then it was just like more digging and more figuring out like, what is this? Like, who am I? Because I've been raised to think that I'm supposed to think this way, but wait a second, like, what do, what are my actual values? Because for everybody, it's so different Mm -hmm. and that's perfect. That's exactly how we're supposed to be. We're just supposed to be us. And that's why I loved what you're, you know, you being the director of this film, it's like, and I haven't watched it. And I'm excited because when it, you know, it's like, um, I'm excited for it just to be like a surprise to me. But Mm -hmm. I believe that we all have to arrive at our own healing in a different way, whatever way that is, whether it's through Mm -hmm. coaching or counseling, maybe both, or it's, you know, music or whatever it is that that helps us just be who we are supposed to be. That's what my hope is for us. That's beautiful. It's also interesting to like join in something that you haven't seen, but we give you as good of a like honest taste <laughs> as we possibly can without showing it to you. Um, but it makes me wonder if I should be giving anyone who pledges to be an associate producer an instant watch <laughs> of the movie because I have a private link I can give people. We can talk well, offline about that. <laughs> you want to wait till I, it's like out out. Yeah, it's like however it, you know however it's supposed to be is is how it's going to be, and I'm totally. Yeah. I believe that and I'm open to that. So Mm -hmm. I like being surprised, you know, but I I believe in, in, you know, because I know what kind of people we were raised to be and that is, that's still in us, you know? So I, I believe in you. I believe in this project Mm -hmm. and I am excited to be a part of it. I want us all to heal. Yeah. 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 And it's, I almost feel like it was an intuitive thing. Like I've just wanted to see, what happens after people in all the form, all the other documentaries on the topic, what happens after mm-hmm. they cry and they roll credits? Like there's so much more and like the proudest moment for me, like an important moment for my life was yeah, walking away from this group. Totally mm-hmm. proud of myself for that. And I'm proud of anyone else who does that. But I went and did stuff that I think is amazing after that. Like I was free <laughs> to finally go do stuff. And uh-huh. I'm sure that that's true of a lot of people. Like they finally uh-huh. were able to go do anything they wanted to do. And if you're yeah. completely untethered from all the links to your past, I met people all over the world, uh-huh. no matter where I was traveling or living that were just all of a sudden I'm hanging out with someone and I find out they're an ex witness or I live with someone for a year, like uh-huh. a year. And they told me they're an ex witness. And like, I was like, wow. like, that's crazy. Like we're wow. like from other countries living in Vietnam together on a motorcycle trip. And now you just reveal this bomb on me. And like, it just kept on happening and happening and happening. I was like, I'm going to lean into that because these people are so impressive. And it's some, it's like an interesting combination of being the kind of person to successfully navigate cult mind control and get out of it. Mm -hmm. It's like a special self-selected group of humans. And then to be completely untethered, to know that that's what's going to happen and embrace that enough to go for it and be like, Mm -hmm. okay, here I am alone in every possible way. Now, what Mm -hmm. can I do? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely nothing in my way. I don't have any support, but I have nothing in my way. So like, fuck it. I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to go to the other side of the planet. I'm going to travel. I'm going to make a business. I'm going to live my passion, live my dream. And that that's inspiring to me. And I wanted to make, I want to put that in the movie. And I feel like in a way we did, because we have like these great example of artists, how they were living in the faith group, mind control, like pressure, Mm -hmm. high pressure world. Mm -hmm. And then when they got out, it was like, Oh, you thought that music was not acceptable or (laughs) like you were upset that we were like kind of edgy. Let us show you what it, what skills and thoughts we've developed. And we're going to put that into a song that people will like have stuck in their head because it's a beautifully catchy song. And we're going to say some crazy 
powerful, not crazy, powerful, powerful things Mm -hmm. about processing trauma and exiting and moving on and and self-empowerment. And it's like the music Mm -hmm. that come out of, comes out of it is sometimes like complicated or complex or like confusing or can be like so powerful and like incredible. And it's putting this campaign together has been interesting because like, it's not necessarily clear in the campaign because we kind of rushed to put all the ideas together. We've, we've been thinking mm-hmm. about them for years and it was like, well, we want to put all the stuff from inside the religion, all the music, all the nuclear go for music together. Mm-hmm. When it's already publicly available, but like we're going to send it to you in one big super package. And also there's, yeah. if you, you know, you can get the physical stuff too. And then there's the post nuclear gopher, the ex witnesses that came that left the religion um, became ex witnesses and went and made amazing music. There's like twice as many albums in a very uh-huh. short period of time. And that yeah. collection's like, wow. And those are the artists that helped us make the thing. It's the people that got out and they're like, yeah, let's tell that story. Let's tell the story of transitioning yeah. to having the life you actually want to live and not suffering. Um, yeah, and then it's like, I, well, now they're rock stars, <laughs> you know, in a sense. I love it. So that's when I, I had sort of an epiphany um, when I had two friends close to me that we grew up together as GWs and, and two of them died. Um, mm. one from a drug overdose and one from drinking himself to death. Wow. Uh, you know, there are people who left the religion. Um, one had left and one was actually still in, you know, okay. sort of suffering. Yeah. And so when, when they passed away, that's really, that is actually the day that the light came on for me. And I, mm. you know, even though people knew that I was faded and they didn't really know my status, what am I doing? I just had to speak out because You know, there was no, it it just, it set me off in a way where I'm like, if somebody doesn't speak up, who's going to speak up and Mm -hmm. who can help people? I can help people. You know, I have the the background. I have the, all the tools, you know, like I was holding myself back. And when I finally like used my voice to really say how, what I believe and why, Mm -hmm. you know, it just, it it was very clear, like who was supporting me and who wasn't. And the, I've just like you, when you say you've taken these trips around the world and you found your people, I found my people too. You know, those are our people because they get us and some people don't have a voice. So I want to be that voice. It's powerful. Yeah. I feel like I'm always looking for tribe. Um, <laughs> yeah. but it's also like, like I'm still looking for that thing. And maybe it's because we were inundated with the, Hey, this is your tribe language mm-hmm. all the time. Like here's your, this is your spiritual community or your spiritual paradise, right. your spiritual family, all this, mm-hmm. these like cult terms and um, not having that. Like one of the thing I missed after getting out was like, where are the old people there was a lot of the village, the concept of like being raised in a village that was really nice about it. Uh-huh. And that you have to like really seek that out or like embrace someone else's parents or something. I'm not a person who's like going to go to another church, but um, I always feel like I'm looking for another tribe. What do you, would you have any, cause a lot of people actually have been in these chats where like ex witnesses are all hanging out together or like group calls. And they're like, yeah. how do you make friends is like uh-huh. a common question I see, especially people who yeah. just left the thing. I haven't uh-huh. had problems with that because I had like a pretty neutral upbringing. Like I had normal uh-huh. friends and witnesses uh-huh. in my life. Uh-huh. So like for me, it was no big deal. It was like refreshing. I was like, finally, I can go, like, go just hang out with the people I want to hang out with. And none of the people I don't want to <laughs> hang out with. Amazing. But like, can you give advice to someone who's like not so long yeah. out, but also doing coaching? I'm like, how do you find community from, so give advice to maybe someone who's listening. Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, what I'll just tell you what I've done for myself and, you know, and then I'll tell you what I've done for my clients. But for myself, what I did is I actually reached out to, to old friends that we grew up together as GW. And I just reached out to them like, Hey, are, are you going to meetings or, you know, just kind of like testing the waters, not really saying, you know what, and then just getting a feel for it. And I've made so many connections because let me tell you, a lot of people we grew up with are not JWs anymore. Like it is, it is a dying um, culture. So if we can reach out to those friends that we had when we were growing up and just see their status, 
it's like those kind of friends are like, it's priceless because Mm -hmm. they know you, they know your story. When a lot of times um, clients come to me and they say, well, I don't know. I just don't feel like I fit in and I'm just a little bit weird. And I don't know, even if, you know, even when you're older, you kind of feel like I'm a little bit different, you know, but the Mm -hmm. thing is with, with going out and meeting people, just complete strangers, you really have to force yourself to do it. So that's what I did for myself is I forced myself to join groups where we actually meet up live. So I'm a member of, it's called the Boss Society of Olympia. I am here in um, Washington state outside of Seattle. Okay. And, cool. um, and it was What's there. What's the name of it again? It's called the, the Boss Society. Boss? Yeah. Like yeah, it's a bunch of- yeah, it's a bunch okay. of girls. We're too, we're just like we're being bosses, you know. It's it's really fun, but really, um, when I had told my story to them, because I had to sort of write like um, my elevator speech, right? Like, what do mm-hmm. you do? I'm like, a minute. good luck making it a, a two sentence right? or ten <laughs> second thing. <laughs> and then I thought, oh geez, I don't know if these people are going to get this like XJW thing. But it was mm-hmm. amazing. Like, it's amazing when you actually tell people how willing and open people are like, oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, they were just, and then I said, there's something to this. Like if Mm -hmm. they get me, I'm not afraid anymore. But sometimes you just, it has to, you have to push yourself to be in those situations. I didn't want to do it, but I just do it. I have to force myself and I'm a natural, uh, I would call myself like introvert, extrovert. Like I can be very introverted, my nose in a book and I'm very happy there. But I can also like liven up and like I love being around people and I love having friends and and just making small talk with people. And we're good at that. We are all good at that because mm-hmm. we were trained to do that. I mean, geez, who else yeah. it just <laughs> meets strangers at their house and knocks on their door and like, how are you? Let me read you a scripture. I mean, geez, right. we, we have more courage and more boldness inside of us than we even realize. It's actually quite the opposite than people would think. Then we would think yeah. like, I don't know, we're a little strange. No, we're not. We have a, a gift of being able to talk to people, strangers. We have a, a gift of doing public talks. I mean, that's a gift. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's one of the strange, like positive sides of it. I have zero fear of talking to any human being and I have absolute zero um, anticip- um, hesitancy to talk to mm-hmm. someone who's from maybe like what could be considered a different class, yeah. higher yeah. or yeah. or lower or whatever. Exactly. Like if someone's super rich and mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, um, <laughs> and I've never been. Um, if someone's super rich and they're in the room, like I have absolutely no qualms about going and saying hi. Yeah. And, and people being weird about that is exactly what, makes it strange <laughs> is that they're like they're not normal because they have more money in their bank account than me which is i mean there's so many people like that right I don't know. anyway so, so like it's interesting mm-hmm. that we had this training i guess is my point mm-hmm. yeah we can we can take it and run with it and it doesn't all have to be done in one day or one week you know it can be done bit by bit over time you have to keep pushing yourself you have to keep testing yeah. yourself i would compare it a lot to dating you know, somebody's mm, like, numbers game. I, I can't <laughs> find my person. Right. I don't know. It's like, okay, well, um, are you like, what are you doing? Are you like on any apps or do you go to these, you know, meetup things or like, what do you do? Oh, I don't do anything. I'm just at home. You know, it's like, you're not going to meet people that way. You know, if you want a right. real physical con- connection one-on-one in person, you really have to put yourself out there. And it is scary. It is scary. Mm -hmm. And even though it's scary, you can still do it little by little. Yeah. I've had a thing recently with um, this film. So the film, we did a a film festival circuit, which is like one of my life dreams is to put a film that that make a film that's at that quality that it would get like public recognition by the highest levels of cinema, cinema people. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I, the guy that's actually helping us with the crowdfund who's joined our producer team, to get Uh the film out. He he's done like 300 films and he's directed a bunch of his own films. He's a trained actor, um, really enthusiastic guy. I really like him, Justin Giddings. Um, Uh And he, he helps us get into 11 film festivals. We won an award at a horror film fest for a documentary, which is so, (laughs) 
so funny. It's like the best, <laughs> best documentary feature award, um, which we're really uh, proud of. And I love that we wanted it at a horror film fest. It's like, you guys, so <laughs> you accepted our documentary like about music and exiting a religion into a horror film fest. I love it. But anyway, just so, all so to say, you, like, I, I had to do public speaking mm-hmm. at all those. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and are you also telling me that you did something that was a little bit scary and it totally So worked. scary. And it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was the best. And, mm-hmm. and now I'm like, Perfect. every sing- so the thing that happens at a film festival is, yeah, your movie plays on a schedule and people will know about it. A lot of it's mm-hmm. talking to people to let them know at the festival and days ahead when your film is going to play and invite them into the screening. And most of the people that are at film festivals are directors, producers, actors, extras, mm-hmm. friends of people, friends of the cast, uh, okay. friends of the director, stuff like that. So it's like a lot of, a lot of deep insider film people and then uh-huh. like their, their connections who are trying to be there to support them. And so it's like super social up front. And at that place are also media people that want to interview filmmakers that are interested in stories that are interesting or like fit their, their niche mm-hmm. or their topic. Um, so that's how you're just like, Oh, let's do an interview right now. And that happens a lot. And you're like, okay, I'm talking about some super heavy thing all of a sudden. And also like what the film is about. And it's exciting. It's like the mix of this being an exciting film that I made. Um, uh-huh. and, and it wasn't just me. It was like, it was like 40 people that got involved uh-huh. over the course of making it, but it's also like a really personal, heavy topic, Yeah, um, which is why I was motivated to make it and why you're here mm-hmm. because it's a personal topic, right? We went through this thing right. and, but to do public speaking, for the first mm-hmm. time ever after <laughs> uh, leaving a religion where you had your forced to do public speaking. And it was like, you get publicly humiliated after doing a thing, <laughs> talking about a topic you don't want to talk about with hundreds yeah. of eyes watching you and then getting judged publicly. And then it's just like, I don't want to do any of this. This is, this is a <laughs> terrible experience. It was a terrible thing I had to do for a week in advance, you know? And then to do that again, it's like, I'm handing out literature it's about this religion and I'm doing public speaking about this religion. I'm like, no, what did I choose this really for? Natural. This is terrible. That's why it's really natural. Like it's in yeah. you. But it's like this huge like anxiety emotion welled up in me and I had my first like anxiety attack in public. And now it's like, okay, I have to like work on managing that because it's that's just a part of there's like some deeper stuff that could probably use your help, your kind of coaching or like a therapy thing to like, let's, let's compartmentalize and figure out what that whole thing is and work it out. But I know I'm just like, I'm doing it. I love it. I'm going to get emotional in public. What's that? I said, we could do that right now if you want. (laughs) Oh, you want to demonstrate your, I don't know that I want to cry in camera today. (laughs) today. But yeah, those types of things, you know, that's what it's all about. And um, just working through it and, yeah, it's totally it's like, possible. This like tightening in the chest that happens, like you're talking about the separation, like you have a sensation and then it's like mm-hmm. an emotion that's like difficult and not like what I want to feel in a public space when people are watching and it's present in real time. And then it's like, a, and I'm like, okay, now I have thoughts about it or complicating the process. Right. So I'm like, I'm trying to say yeah. a specific thing to make uh-huh. a point that's powerful, but it's like triggering all these emotions. And then the complication uh-huh. of that happening in real time, it's like, uh-huh. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> this is a lot all at once. And then I wait, I give myself a beat and I, my voice cracks and I say the thing and then you move on and then it keeps on working. And it's like, okay, this is, this is an interesting process in real time. But, and, you, and you did it. Yeah. And then after that, then what? And then it keeps did going because people are like, this is fascinating and riveting. And it's like, <laughs> this person's vulnerable. Let's, let's keep yeah. asking them questions that dive in deeper on that. <laughs> and then so it's like, then it becomes amazing. It. Yeah. They loved it. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, if we never speak up, we can never touch those people, you know? Yeah. Right. And it's, it's like, I felt when I was going to release the movie or even when I just originally pitched the concept of the movie and it, we did a crowdfund in 2018 for this. Mm-hmm. And um, it was so interesting on that topic because I was like, in my imagination, I'm like, I'm going to be releasing this incredible, this incredible new device, you know, like a, a a startup has their new, amazing world changing product, like the iPhone. And everyone's going to be like, Oh my God, what? I have to have it. That's incredible. (laughs) I'm putting, I'm going to fund your stock. You know, I'm going to buy into this concept. But in the end, I'm like, people are like, what about your mom? Like, do you miss her? And it's like, Oh my God. Yeah. But like, can we talk about the movie I'm about to make? And they're like, 
you said it's going to be personal. Let's talk about the deep, heavy stuff. And then I'm like getting emotional in public. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that was not the vision I had of myself. But at the same time, people are like fascinated by it because they don't have that. They don't have a 10 year break with their family. And yeah. it's, it's a, it is a part of it. And I don't, the film does dive into shunning, mm -hmm. um, but we don't stay there forever. We demonstrate it. We demonstrate how dark it can get. And mm -hmm. then we move on to the next dark thing. And then eventually like we have the rising of the, we have the musical music side of it, empowering people and giving them their own voice. And that, that combination for me is like, I'm so happy with it. It's I'm so proud of it. Hey. Yeah, that's, and that's what I love about coaching. It's like all of these things can happen to us and we can have this crazy, you know, JW past experience and life can go on. It's like, mm -hmm. it's sort of like from this moment right now with you, like we're in this one moment and then it's just so exciting to look at like what's going to happen. You know, instead yeah. of looking so much in the back, it's like, it's kind of like the counseling part of it would be like, okay, what happened in the past, but we're here right now. And then what? Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Yeah, no, it's super exciting. No, I absolutely love that perspective. And I've been trying to share something like that. Even the crowdfund, it's like months of work to get this thing put together and then push the release button. I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. And this is day one. <laughs> this is day zero. Fuck. Okay. Um, but for me, it's like, yeah, the crowdfund for me, it's like, we're working with people that are passionate and we've made something that's amazing that we're so proud of. And we spent, we, we made sure it's at the highest level of quality we could possibly do. And I people that. that came out of the woodwork to make it happen, like really, really did amazing work. And the reviews are amazing that we're getting. And the people that watch it, like half a quarter of the people that watch it, write me a letter. Like, Oh my God, I cried four times and I had to watch it again. And I invited my family to watch it. And then now my friend, you know, it's like, so there's been, there's been a few different ways people have been able to watch it and we get these amazing reviews. And, um, but for me, it's like, yeah, the crowdfund, sure. Like we need that to take the next step, which is wide release, but I care way more about this kind of connection and what happens during this process, because we're just trying to like find the people that will care yeah. Yeah. as part of like marketing and like pushing this out into the world. And I'm yeah. so excited about what, what collaborations happen next after because this is just the beginning for me it's like i mean for me it's five it years in and it feels like the end of something but at the same time it's like finally it's the beginning of the phase where it's in the world making the impact i wanted it to make right and then what's next yeah you know that part that's the most exciting thing and that's what the, all the other <laughs> films and not to harp on this but like all there's so many good films on the topic but yeah. like they often end with oh it sucks oh i'm sad you know or or like, mm -hmm. look at like a news, a lot of news documentaries do this thing, which drives me crazy. And that's one of my yeah. biggest hangup. And we talk about it in the pitch video. It's like, this terrible thing happens inside this religious group and you'll never believe it. These are the no birthday people. Think <laughs> yeah. That was it. They're just like the Jesus people with no birthdays. Like not so, <laughs> not so, not so evil sounding, but look at how dark they are. Roll credits. And it's like, you see a person cry, you feel pity. And it's like, oh, oh, oh. What happens next is so much cooler and more interesting than that. Yeah, we all suffer a little bit, but like the other thing, the other empowerment thing. Yeah, I mean, look at That's us, so... right? We're, we're doing mm -hmm. it, you know, yeah. we're doing it. And it's it, this is just the beginning. That's how I like to think of it. I, I agree. There's something that keeps coming up. So trying to find people who wanted to help us with the crowdfund and, and just the, getting the word out about this film. Mm -hmm. A number of, especially women, I had a phone call with, who were like, I just left the religion and mm -hmm. I, I, I have a kid and mm -hmm. I now believe I'm going to die for the first time ever. And mm -hmm. that yeah. I can't pursue my dreams. I gave up on the dreams of my twenties. I gave up on the dreams of my thirties. Here mm -hmm. I am in the middle and I, or I didn't have a baby or I just had a baby. And now I'm, now I'm guess I'm just a mom now, or mm -hmm. like I was going to play music, but I, I didn't have that opportunity. So that opportunity is completely lost. And I kept mm -hmm. hearing this kind of language mm -hmm. and it got me thinking, this is in the last month or two. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, how do you make your second wind strong? And, and one thing I thought of is like, I was in a band. I was in three bands. Uh -huh. Did I take any of them seriously? Kind of, but as serious as any 19 year old can take something who mm -hmm. lives in the middle of the woods and is in a weird religious group. <laughs> Not that far. And I had a lot of other things that were distracting me from paying attention to that. But if I were now to become a musician or like mm -hmm. take it seriously, mm -hmm. I would do so from the perspective of an adult 
who yeah. recognizes the value of time and mm -hmm. values other people's time. And if you're going to do something, you're going to do it with passion and intensity and, and yeah. um, with a goal in mind and right. be dedicated. I, I really think that like, if you're, if you're in that situation where you're like, Oh no, like I missed out on everything. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to suffer mm -hmm. and like be a, a passive observer to my own life, which is mm -hmm. kind of what the religion basically teaches us to do, mm -hmm. uh, teaches you to do like, you have this opportunity as an adult to just grab it by the horns and like do exactly what you want to do in six months yes. and then have the thing you want or in two years or whatever, five years. But like you can, cause, cause we're adults and because we know what it takes. I mean, cause we yeah. understand how the world works, shorten the time. Yeah. I like to, focus. I like to call that the, the miserable middle, you know, mm -hmm. you know, we're like not making a decision is actually making the, a decision. If mm -hmm. you don't do anything and you just stay in that miserable middle, you, I mean, you will be miserable, you know, it is going to be that way. It's, you have to get, you have to take some of that stuff with you and leave some of it behind. Mm -hmm. you, could, you don't have to take everything if you don't want to, it's only up to you. And I remember having that feeling when I finally woke up, like really woke up. I'm like, Oh my God, like there's not a paradise, like I am going to die. And my feeling was, I have to start living right now, right now. And my path hasn't been easy. You know, I, and I relate to a lot of those women, you know, I, I am a single mom. Um, I have a wonderful supportive boyfriend, but we do chose, I have chosen to live alone because that's what I want. And he lets me be free. But, um, yeah, I had that really overwhelming feeling, like you're saying, of, like, I can do this. And, like, I really need to do it with all the passion and determination. It's never too late. I don't care if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, that you are still alive. There is still a life to live. And you do mm -hmm. have a purpose. Yeah. There's, there's a, a really good book. Oh, sorry. Oh, I said there's there's still value there, you know? Yeah. There's a book, this actually, this community of people that the film was about really were a big part of my path in getting out properly. And uh -huh. we all kind of communicated over that barrier that's supposed to exist that they want you to create right. um, with your community, friends, family. And mm -hmm. because of the music and because of the friendship and bond that we had, there was still communication happening. And it was, it was mm -hmm. not always easy. It was a bit stilted at times, but mm -hmm. um, we kept in communication and, um, Eric from the film and I had maybe the strongest relationship of anyone in the film at that time. Mm -hmm. And he sent me a book. Well, we actually sent a lot of books to each other around that time, but with one of the books was, um, the atheist way. Okay. And so ever, like people left the faith and for the most part, like clean slate, like, okay, mm -hmm. that was some bullshit. Like we're <laughs> at zero now. <laughs> right. There isn't no supernatural. <laughs> the demons aren't trying to like, attack us and, and persuade us away from the path. Um, uh -huh. you know, there's no paradise, like the lions that we're going to pet and the fruit baskets <laughs> we're going to be carrying in all the imagery and propaganda that they put out. It look, actually looks just like communist propaganda in Russia, Vietnam, know. China, Korea. Like we lived in like basically a communist dystopia our whole lives <laughs> yes. with, with all the fruit and, <laughs> and, and, uh, farming that is required, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um, the atheist way was interesting because it's like, well, what is, if, if there really is no supernatural and there is no meaning, then what meaning can you make? Or like, what's the path to finding purpose in life? Mm -hmm. And it really came down to, I mean, I feel like that book was like foundational for me at that time. I like, have to oh, well, you have to do it yourself. Uh -huh. you can, like a religion's like, here's the package. Here's everything that's important. And now this is your identity. Wear all right. these things, follow all these rules, believe all this stuff. And none of this stuff on the outside, just what we right. tell you. Mm -hmm. Be angry about everything that doesn't conform. Um, be emotional. Like we're telling you to be emotional. And, and like when you make your own meaning, it's okay. Well, what am I putting here? I want to choose mm -hmm. one thing at a time. And eventually you have this, like, I built my own framework of what's important and meaningful to me. I think it's really important to like um, sort of melt the programming loops that are in your brain down to mm -hmm. the base neurons and then mm -hmm. go find and, and the meaning and the purpose and all the things that are supposed to be important. 
cons- like for me, and I think a lot of people in the film um, had something similar, like, all right, let's, let's break it down to the fundamentals. None yeah. of that is real. None of that's important. Absolute yeah. zero. There is no morality. The Bible is valueless garbage texts from a tribe in the middle of the desert from thousands of years ago. Like forget it all. Let's start with like what, what's important to you personally right now. Find the thing that brings your curiosity. That's a hard, it's hard. It takes a lot of effort, but then it's like also it really, does. really exciting to make your own thing. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it, t- it does take effort. And I mean, what you're saying is what I, ex- exactly what I believe too. So we do have to break it down to the base level. And that is what coaching is all about. It's about what do we believe? And it's okay. Whatever you want to believe. I want to believe, you know, whatever you believe, anybody believes that that's totally fine. That doesn't really have anything to do with me. Right. I can believe how I want to believe. And I'm, um, yeah, that's what I want for everybody is for us to just be who we are. So I, you know, sometimes I struggle with that too. Like, you know, I don't believe that Jesus is my savior personally. Um, I'm happy for people that do believe that. I think that's wonderful. Um, I'm not sure about God. I just believe that there's something bigger, you know, Mm -hmm. I believe that the whole universe literally has my back. Mm. I have my mom and dad have passed away. Um, my grandmas, both of them too, my grandfathers. So I do feel them sometimes like, you know, like they like little signs that I get that it's like, they're still with me, you know, and Mm -hmm. they're kind of pushing me on to, to bigger things. So that's, that's my belief. And here's the thing. It's always changing. Right. And that's totally fine too. Maybe we're going to find out more things and read more stuff. It's like, "Mm, maybe I do believe that, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, Thanks for sharing. Um, the, there's some, another person, Daniel Torridan, who's, um, some, one of his books is in our campaign the I am God. He's written a bunch of books. He has a, just going to promote him. Shout out. Uh, Flax and Wick <laughs> course he put together for like leaving the faith and like it's a whole thing. Okay. He has a whole world. It's called Onion Unlimited is his channel on YouTube. Wow. Okay. He has this cool concept I never thought of before, but he's like, once you leave, you can think of it as trying on clothes at a store. Yeah. Like, I'm going to try on this belief idea mm-hmm. and see how it feels to wear it, to speak in mm-hmm. the, from that perspective. And you can yep. take that off and it's not going mm-hmm. to um, destroy your future or your access to some future paradise. It's not going to re- destroy your relationship with some deity somewhere, or right. you don't have to identify with it. You can just say like, I'm interested in this idea and mm-hmm. you don't have to own it ever. But the idea of like uh-huh. taking something on and, and then getting rid of it. And like, you can just yeah. constantly do that forever for the rest of your life. And I like yeah. the idea of like, it's clothes, it's just clothes and you can change it. Uh-huh. I like to teach that same thing with, with different thoughts, try it mm. on. How does that feel? You know? Yeah. And maybe it is right for you and maybe it's not, then it's easy to just change it. Yeah, definitely. I believe that too. Cool. Sounds like we have a lot of similar concepts. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's nice. Who knew, right? Yeah. I had no idea. I mean, all we've done is chatted a little bit after you um, joined our crowdfund. So, um, <laughs> Of course Thank it would you. be that way. You know, we all yeah. do have a commonality. You know. I have a question that might be, so like I've, I did actually try out a coach um, this mm-hmm. year and it was a student coach. He's like, I need some hours. So I'll yeah. give you a discount rate. And I tried it out. <laughs> it was interesting, but I, and I had not really tried therapy. And I think there's probably a lot of uh, until a couple of years ago, almost two years ago mm-hmm. for the first time. And so I was, you know, 14 years out of the religion before I like got some okay. professional help. I yeah. don't recommend that that's the right path. I tried making a movie and that was more triggering than helping, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so like you eventually got therapy, but I, I was, maybe you can tell the audience and we can wrap up here because we were about 50 minutes. Oh, okay. um, but I would, and you can say what you want, but I would, let's say we have 10 more minutes. Um, okay. What would you say the difference is between uh, getting a coach like yourself mm-hmm. or working with a licensed therapist? And there's different flavors of that. Mm-hmm. or a psychologist and, and like, what would you, what is like a, what's like maybe even the cost difference? Cause that can be an issue or like, what, mm-hmm. are, what are their skill and, and path differences or maybe even how fast to get from one thing to the next thing, depending on who you work with or what kind of world you work in. 
Like, can you right. like dismantle or like detangle yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would say it would depend on the person and, and what, um, really when a client comes to me and, and they want help, you know, I would do a consultation and see if it would be a good fit, you know, and maybe it could be something to wear. Like I said before, it would be a therapy and coaching, or maybe somebody just wants coaching. Maybe the counseling part or the therapy is didn't work for them. It's so individual to each person. And so that's mm-hmm. what I have to do as a coach when I um, have a consultation with somebody is see um, really what is the best thing for them. It's not about me and my business or what I'm doing. It's really, I would recommend to that person, whatever I feel is best for them. A lot of times with therapy, we're, like I said, we're going in the past. So it might take some, um, if you want to, you know, dig up those things and work through them with a therapist. And it depends. There's all sorts of therapists, right? So, um, or maybe it's just, you know, you're at a place where you're like, let's move forward. And we can still go through things in the past. When somebody comes to me and we go through all of the, you know, the past and we, you know, do the whole consultation, then I, I would be able to get a feel for it and see like, you know, is this something that I can't personally handle because I don't want to take on something and say, oh, I can fix everybody, you know, because that may not be the case. So mm-hmm. for me personally, what I did for myself is I did a combination of group therapy. I did a little bit of counseling. Um, and then I did full on life coaching and hired my own coach. So depending on the wow. person and, and what they would bring to me is I would recommend yeah. them, you know, but usually what I see is like a year long is really, is really is a whole complete transformation. Mm-hmm. From my experience, one thing that's kind of frustrated me and maybe you can speak to this is I hired a professional like, and she was amazing. Like I've learned a lot, but the sessions were like, okay, we're in it. I'm emotional. Like I'm like all the wounds are open. All the big topics are in, like, it's rough. And then it's like, okay, well, that was really nice. I'll talk to you next week. And then it's like five minutes later, I had a work meeting. And that was like all of our sessions were like, okay, now I'm showing up to a work meeting in this like crazy, disorganized, emotional state. And mm-hmm. that just cost me a lot of money. And there's like no sort of aftercare. Like, well, how are you doing? Or like um, the, the smooth landing. Cause it's like a 50 minute right. session. And right. like what I think could be really valuable to me Um, or maybe others is to like go to a retreat where this is the focus and you just get care that you need, or like you work through the stuff in live sessions that they're not limited to 50 minute sessions or one hour sessions. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wait until next week to finish the conversation or like get back into that place or something. Yeah. Um, I have a, I actually am, I'm trying to put together a retreat for April. And to have that where I can invite people and we can do coaching and we can just tune out the world and just totally take the time for ourselves to go through these things. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. And also my, my coaching that I do once someone signs with me, they have full access to me, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's ongoing support. You know, it's not just, the phone call ends and that ends like I'm literally holding your hand the whole way as much as humanly possible for me. Hmm. So So this concept of aftercare, is that, is that something that you're, that you use or is that a language that's in your world? Aftercare. And what is your definition of aftercare? I don't know because I've never experienced it, but people have said (laughs) that that's what I'm missing. Um, (laughs) And it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you have a more comprehensive, like holistic, we're partners in this process yeah. type experience. But yeah. from what I've talked to a friend of mine, um, he's like, yeah, the one hour session therapy. I mean, that's, they want you as a repeat customer. So like healing you and helping you, like, although that is their job, it's sort of like, we want you also to come back next week and rip open mm-hmm. another wound so that you come back again next week and keep paying is like a part yeah. of the capitalist side of it. That's not so healthy. And I don't think any of the people I've worked with have been like, you know, had any negative intentions like that. Like, I think they do really genuinely want to like assist, but I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't work because I I'm broken and not fixed today. And Um, thanks a lot. Anyway, 
that's what therapy will do. They'll just, we'll be digging up stuff. But then it's like, wait a second, because we're right here. And what about where we're going? Mm -hmm. You know, we can't, we can't go in the past and change anything. But what we can do is change our thoughts about the past. Mm -hmm. And then we can go forward in the future and, and, and learn from it and decide what we want to do, whatever's best for us. And that's, yeah. and that's why I love coaching so much because it's really not, you know, like the movies you were talking about, the documentaries that's like, oh, everything was so bad. And, you know, and then it's like, okay, now what? I mean, to me, that's kind of how you're describing therapy in a way, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. okay, now what? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. okay, I'm here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those experiences were good in that I did learn what those mm -hmm. issues were. And I did get some really positive, powerful tools yeah. to self regulate those same kinds of things in the future. And also go, like you were saying before, like feel the feelings, mm -hmm. go sit with that feeling and go through it. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy, but now I have tools to like manage it, which is better yeah. than just sort of like being derailed for the day um, right. when something happens. Yeah. Sometimes it's so not I'm so grateful. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's not easy, you know, but look at all the things that you've done that are not easy, you know, and it has served you and you have grown and figured out yeah. who you are and where you want to go. So it's all valuable, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's not always so easy, but. I think it's good. This idea of like a one year sort of, all right, we're doing this. This is, this is part yeah. of my year. Like make yeah. a new year's resolution. It's coming up soon here. You're going to need one of those and call Al. Yeah, oh, and at yeah. any time we can start our new year, right? It, it can true. start like yeah. right now. It could start tomorrow, whatever. Now yeah, is my favorite start. time of day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And like these little goals that we have, those are actual goals, you know, the little things mm -hmm. do matter. Yeah. I actually read this, I think it's in Atomic Habits, the book. It's I like, love okay, it. so your goal is to run a marathon. Well, good luck. If that's how you're starting your day, how about your goal could be anything that's two minutes or less? Like how about put on your shoes, your running yeah. shoes. That's yeah. the goal for the day. And then what happens yeah. next is like, you actually go do the thing. Even if it's just like you go run around the block or you go for a walk, that's, that's yeah. like pushing you in the direction of the, the huge overarching goal, but don't give yourself gigantic goals that yeah. you have to do today. Give yourself like the two minute goals. And then it's like, then your, your mind will just go like, Oh yeah, I can put my shoes on. That's easy. Yeah. That's all I have and to do. You know, you're just doing it every day. I love that because it just snowballs yeah. into like, oh, yeah. this is just who I am now. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. So if well, someone wants to contact you, what's the best way to find you? And then we'll we'll let the audience get back to their days. <laughs> um, the best way to contact me would be um, my email, lrenocoaching at gmail. It's L-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Reno yeah. Coaching. Yeah. Or you could reach out to me on Facebook. Um, I have a Facebook group there. It's called, I just want to heal and move on. And I have a little group there. That's a nice, safe place to be in. Awesome. Yeah. Great. And then if you were to encourage anyone to check out the witness underground Kickstarter, what would you say? Do it. <laughs> I'm just so excited about all the healing, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to be um, a part of something that is positive that um, that people can see that, you know, we can do it our own way. We can heal in our own way. So I would say, yeah, go for it. Be a part Amazing. of it. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on today yeah. and we'll get this out today. Okay. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Well, take care. Bye. Bye.